about the calling of the elect. Um, I didn't think I heard enough noise out there. So. Um, now I'm wired, so if I say something wrong, somebody hit the button and shot me. Um, several years ago, there was a popular supermarket chain that uh, put out a commercial that I thought was pretty cute. It was uh, this little group of uh, grade schoolers going through the uh, facilities there at the grocery store chain and and they were looking at these pallets of gallons of milk stacked up and ready to be shipped and one of them said milk comes from cows and the other one says no they don't have cows anymore the other one said well then where does milk come from from Publix <laughs> sometimes as wrong as that is in reality where do most people think that milk and produce and things like that come from that live in cities. You know, they, the grocery store. That's where it comes from for them. Yeah, that's where they get it from. And uh, we, we look at these things and we don't have a concept of reality because what we have been told and what like, all that we have seen all of our lives gets in the way of truth. Now the same thing happens in religion quite often. When people think of the people of God, they generally don't come to the source of material for it. They don't go to the cow, as it were, to get the milk. They go to the preacher to get the milk, to the Bible class teacher, to the, the priest, to the church. And what they get is something that doesn't fit with what's in here. And even for those oftentimes who do come to straight to the Bible, we have all of these things that we have been taught by those that are wrong, that don't understand the Word of God, swirling around in our head, and when we read something in the Scriptures, we somehow misinterpret it. Because we interpret it on the basis of the things that we have heard. For example, when you hear about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, what do you think of? I tell people all the time, that's not a scriptural concept. And I've had brethren argue with me, well, the Holy Spirit does dwell in us. And I say, yeah, the Holy Spirit does dwell in us. But the indwelling of the Holy Spirit has been defined by those who misunderstand how the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And so when we talk about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, to a lot of people's ears, that is not the same concept as what the Bible teaches about how the Holy Spirit dwells in us. It's two different things. And so we need to be careful that when we go back to the Scriptures, we don't bring preconceived notions back there and insert them within the text. I've heard brethren talk about how the Holy Spirit dwells in us and read a passage of Scripture and then turn around and place a denominational uh, definition on the words of the Scripture that don't fit what the Scripture's talking about. And I'll say, see, this, this Scripture shows this. Well, wait a minute, you just redefine terms. You know, if you go over to India and you talk about God to the average man on the street who's a Hindu, you know what his concept of God is? Lord Krishna, uh, any Brahmin caste member that's walking down the street, that's God. When Moses went, when Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and they said, God says, let my people go, well, Pharaoh's concept of God was, I'm a God. Who's your God? I've never heard of him before. Why should I listen to him? I'm a God too. And, you know, I'm just as good as your God. And so it did not translate in his brain the same as it did when God brought the walls of water in the Red Sea back over the top of him and completely destroyed him. At that point, I'm certain he understood who Moses' God really was. 
apparently up to that point, he didn't really get the message. Uh, but he did, you know, he certainly did after that point uh, when he was facing the true God. But uh, because all people are going to get it then. But we, we need to be certain, and, you know, the whole point of saying this is we need to be certain that as we're approaching the subject of the people of God, that we look at the scriptures and only the scriptures and we don't try to insert definitions or ideas that we have. Now, this is, these are very basic lessons that we're talking about here. And uh, we're, we're just going back to the beginning to talk about the people of God. And as I said earlier, I, I really would rather, if we could leave the word church out of our discussion for these discussions and use the word assembly. Because every time you hear that word of church, the word church should mean assembly in your mind. But even in my mind, sometimes I get these notions and I have to disabuse myself of them because I start thinking of an institutional concept of a thing that isn't an institution in the way it's been defined by the Catholics and by the Protestants. Um, in our studies, we've talked about uh, words, elect, and chosen. And uh, this is, these are two of those words that have been misdefined by most of I say misdefined by most of the world. And uh, they think something different when you talk about the elect of God. And uh, the, the idea is that God chooses beforehand the people that he's going to save. And he chooses beforehand the people who are lost. And one doctrine teaches that God chose all of this before the foundation of the world. He decided whether Mark Morris is going to be is going to go to heaven or, or I'm going to go to hell. And there's nothing I can do to change it. Now, this concept began really with a, with a Catholic concept of original sin. I'm not going to take time to spell the whole thing out, but this is where the whole idea started. And this idea says that when Adam and Eve sinned, that the sin of Adam carries down to all mankind, and every child that is born is born in sin. Not his own sin, but the sin of Adam. And that sin is inherited by all men. Now, some of my brethren, believe it or not, and I was shocked when I, when I ran into this a few times over the years, but some of our own brethren believe this concept of original sin. And that we all inherit the sinfulness of Adam. Now, the Catholic writers were the ones that re really originated this, Augustine being one that, that had this concept sort of loosely defined, in some of his writings, he was one of the second, quote, second century church fathers, as they call them. And uh, he talked about this concept somewhat. And a lot of times we think, you know, all those guys that, that were so close to the writing of the original books must have had a good handle on what it actually said. But in fact, when we read most of their writings, there was just as much false doctrine being taught in the second century as there was in the first century. Why were most of the letters of the epistles to the churches written? Wouldn't it to combat heresy? The Corinthian church had a man who was living with his father's wife. They had uh, those there that were showing favoritism to one another and, and having clicks in that local congregation and well we're going to associate you know the people on this side we're only going to associate with each other we're not going to associate with y'all over here and you know this kind of thing we're better than you because we have the gift of, of, uh, of healing and, and you've only got the gift of you know speaking in tongues or whatever it might be and uh, I think it was actually the opposite those that thought that were speaking in tongues thought they had the superior gift and the fact is they all of these gifts given by the Holy Spirit were given to glorify God and not those who had them. 
And so Paul had to write this letter, these two letters, to the Corinthians. Uh, and in the first letter, he wrote about the brother who was living with his father's wife and told them what to do with him, to deliver him to Satan, which is pretty harsh terminology, that his flesh would be destroyed and his spirit would be saved. And then the second letter, he wrote about the brother that they had, uh, had formerly disciplined, and I believe he's talking about the same man. There's not proof that that's the case. But he tells them that, you know, the, the punishment or the discipline that they've given him is sufficient. It's brought him back. Now let's move on. And so whatever this brother was, they had disciplined him, and then they were still casting his sin in his face. And he said, you know, you're going to drive him back away from the Lord if you keep on doing that. Let's move forward now. Encourage him in the Lord. And so all of these letters that were written in the first century, were written because these heresies were already working their way into the church. And so we can't trust the second century church fathers, except that we can trust that what they were writing were things that were being taught at that time. That's really all that, you know, they give us some evidence of that. And really, you know, today when you look at it, there's not really anything new under the sun. As Solomon said, it's the same heresies today as it was back then. They may be called something different, but they're basically the same. Um, but this doctrine of original sin, uh, the Catholic Church uh, developed into the doctrine of, uh, many call it Mariolatry. That's not really a word, but it's, it's a coin word, coin phrase. But uh, this, this doctrine that uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, is to be worshipped, uh, sprung from that idea of original sin, and they actually had to uh, to get Mary to be able to be bodily assumed and all of the things that they teach about her, they had to back original sin up one generation away from Mary so that she wasn't born with original sin. Um, and that's the, some real mental gym, gymnastics going on there to do that. But the idea of original sin that Augustine uh, took up and formulated into a series of, of Doctrines that Calvin, John Calvin, later on in the 17th century, picked up Augustine's ideas about original sin and how it affected man, and he developed it into the codified form of doctrine that we know as Calvinism. Calvinism has most often been uh, described as Tula and uh, we have man being born as totally depraved by inheritance, by inheritance, and then because man is totally depraved, he can't do anything good, no matter how hard he tries. Christ had to come, and he had to save man. But if, man is, if I'm totally depraved and Christ reaches out to me and says, Mark Morris, you're saved, well, I can't accept his salvation. And so it's an unmerited favor. Because I can't do anything to be saved. Christ only died for the elect. That's limited atonement. Christ only died for the elect and not for the whole world. And how many passages of Scripture can we think of that say the opposite? Um, then that grace had to be irresistible. Because again, if uh, God reaches out to me in His grace and mercy and says, Mark Morris, you're saved, I'm going to say, I don't want any part of that I'm because I'm, I'm up here. And so I can't resist the grace of the Savior. And if all of this is true, then I can never, purpose of here, hands of saints, then I can never be lost. If God saves me through his uh, divine providence, I can never lose that salvation. Now, all of these things are bound up in one, one idea, and that is that God is completely sovereign, 
He chooses everything about my life and about your life. And there is no way that we can resist him. He is the complete Lord and sovereign being over everything that exists. If one point of that tulip is not true, then all of the points fall. Because if, for example, I can merit favor with God, then that means that God's not sovereign. And if God's not sovereign, then I could resist His grace, and I could fall away from Him. Now, a lot of Calvinists will accept part of this, but they won't accept the entire tulip. My grandmother was a member of the Hanging Fort Baptist Church in Kentucky. She believed in the perseverance of the saints. She was a good woman. She believed in the scriptures. She read her Bible every day. But she hadn't known the church for many years. And, you know, we talked to her, talked to her. But she was confident of her salvation. She could never fall away from it. But she did not believe in the total inherited depravity of man. She did not believe in the irresistible grace of God. She believed that she accepted the grace of God when she came forward and she prayed through on the mortar's bench. And Christ saved her because she went to the Lord to get salvation. Now, you can't believe in perseverance in the saints if you don't believe in the other because they're all bound up in that one idea of the sovereignty of God's will. But sometimes we come to the scriptures and we have, by the way, uh, Wayne told me that something obviously a redneck Calvinist came up with a different process for this called bacon. And I can't remember what the bacon stands for. The same thing. So, um, but uh, we all, many of us will come to the scriptures, and this is such a pervasive doctrine in the world today, that we will approach this idea of the people of God carrying some of this baggage with us. And when we read statements of Scripture, instead of putting them in context and understanding them the way God meant them, we bring some of this stuff with us sometimes. And this is just one example of that. But we need to be careful about not doing that. Put all these preconceived notions out of your mind. Unlearn everything you've learned as we're going through this series of lessons, and let's just look at what the Scriptures say, and let's just do it all over again fresh. It's a good exercise to do that every now and then with some scripture that you think you know. Um, let's look at question number one in our lesson. I'll get there. Chosen and elect are linked with what words in the scripture? Okay, the called out. What's another way of saying that? Those who have been, those who are saved. well saved, but sanctified. sanctified. From its root, what does the word sanctified really mean? Set apart. Now that's all it really means. Okay, if we take, for example, in a sense, you see, I'm sanctified by the fact that I'm set apart to stand up here and teach the class. That separates me from the rest of the class. In its most literal root usage, that's all it means. Now, the word did come to me in matters of spirituality or holiness. And so one who has been sanctified or set apart is one who has become holy. And so he's set apart from what to what? Of the world to God, exactly. And so when one is elect or one is chosen, that word is really, those words are really used in conjunction with that sanctification process. Now, what's that process? And we've talked about this in previous lessons. Is it that God, is it that we were totally depraved from birth? And God came down and brought his unmerited favor upon us, choosing us before the foundation of the earth. Is that what it's called? 
We looked at Acts chapter 2 a few lessons ago. What did Peter say to the, to the people that were gathered there? In Acts 2. There we are. Wait a minute. If I'm totally depraved, how can I repent? It doesn't fit, does it? It doesn't fit. Now he says in our lesson book that the word elect and chosen are often translated from the great same Greek word eklektos. Uh, ekklesia. Eklektos have a similar root there. Uh, many are called but few are chosen. For the elect's sake in Matthew 22, 24, 22. Matthew 22, 14 was, was one. And then uh, in Revelation 17 and 14, for he is, is uh, for he that is Christ is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. Those who are with him are called chosen, eclectos, and faithful. Note the and faithful. Um, if God calls His people, we need to understand how He calls them, and that's what this lesson is all about, really. Um, let's turn to Ephesians chapter one. This is a passage that is sometimes completely misinterpreted and misused. To, uh, to try to teach doctrines that are just not found in the scripture. So let's look at the context of the entire statement that Paul makes here. Somebody read for me verses 3 through 14 of Ephesians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons, through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, for the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our, trans her, our trespasses, and according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens, and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ, would be to the praise of his glory. In him, you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who was given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. All right. Now, when we just pull a few statements... Well, let me ask a question first. Does the Bible teach the concept of predestination? Does it teach predestination? Yes. I said the concept of predestination. That could be understood as the denominational concept. That's not what I mean. Yes, it teaches predestination. What kind of predestination? This passage tells us. And if you look at it in context, it tells us very clearly what that predestination is. Key verses here, and, and again, look at these in the context. Verse 4, he chose us in him, in Christ. It doesn't say he chose us before the foundation of the world without any sense or, or regard to our merit. It says he chose us in Christ. Oh. Well, it's interesting you bring that up. But he, he further goes on in this sentence here, along with the same thought, he says that we would be holy and blameless before him. Okay, well, God's doing his part. Guess what? There's a part for us to play. 
Right. It's just not something he pours on us. We got to. And that was my next next statement, and I'm glad you were thinking that. That means two great minds think alike, either that or <laughs> the other. I'd argue with you about the great mind on my part, but that's all right. <laughs> And, and that's correct. There, it's this predestination that's taught in the Bible is a two-way street. God predestined us in Christ, but he calls us, but we have to answer the call. Is essentially, is another way to say this. And that's what's said here in context. Looking then also at verse 9. Um, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention which he purposed in him. Okay? He made known to us the mystery of his will. Well, you know, the Jews didn't understand where all of this was going. They didn't understand what God really wanted for them because it wasn't explained in the old in the Mosaic Law like it is in the Law of Christ to us. And so we have the mystery revealed. But here again, if the mystery is revealed, there's an obligation on our part to come to it. Um, so he made known to us, then verse 12, um, to the end that we who were the first hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. It doesn't say he made us to the praise of his glory. It says in the hope. Or to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be. Again, that shows an obligation on our part to come to this thing that God has predestined us to. So yes, God predestined us in Christ. Now what do we have to do to receive that predestined glory? We have to come to Christ and we have to be in Christ. Go ahead, Tom. Well, I mean, look at all just one long sentence here. You know, it's, it's, it's all, I mean, it, you can go back to verse 4 and you can go, oh, okay, I'm going to take this that we would be holy and blameless before him. And then go throw that in with uh, verse 12, uh, to the praise of his glory in that respect. Mm -hmm. And it's not a difficult concept to figure out. Okay, and then verse 14. Who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession, um, 13, I'm sorry. Um, in him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. What came before their being sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise? They listened to the message and they believed the message. Faith cometh by and hearing by the word of God. So there's, there's something that comes before that, that's our part of, you might say, the bar, as it were. It's not a situation where God just calls us and, and we don't have any choice in the matter. He doesn't put us in here because uh, he chose us before the foundation of the world. Now, if we look on beyond what we read here in verse 19... Let's start back at verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the surpassing greatness of his power to those of us who believe? These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his mind. Here again, there's a piece of the puzzle that we have to put in. And that's faith. Reading from verse 2, verses 1 through 3, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. Why were you dead in your trespasses and sins? Because you inherited the total depravity of Adam in that original sin. Is that what it says? It says you walked in depravity. Therefore, you were totally depraved. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience, 
Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love, which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God predestined, it says prepared beforehand, but that's predestination, so that we would walk in them. Wow. There's something we need to do to receive this grace. In essence, it's like the preacher who was in a debate with another preacher and the, and the, the uh, Calvinist preacher was saying, there's nothing you can do. It's a free gift of God. You can't do anything to receive it. And the gospel preacher stood up and he said, I have this uh, pen that I have uh, engraved with your name. And he said, I'd like to give it to you as a gift if you'll come up and receive it. And the Calvinist preacher started to stand up and come up and he stopped free gift. Very nice pen. Calvin's preacher sat back down because he realized that he just lost the point. You know, when I give, we just had a birthday party for my grandson Sammy and granddaughter Leah yesterday at our house. And a lot of gifts were put on the table for those two children by all the <coughs> grandparents and aunts and uncles and everybody that came. And they opened those packages. Well, were they free gifts? Absolutely. But what did they have to do to give them? They had to unwrap them. They had to open them. And they had to receive them. Now, I'm going to get ahead of myself here. When I have to repent and be dipped in that water back there to be saved, is being dipped in water, is that sufficient to atone? I mean, just let's throw the Bible out for just a minute, okay? Just common sense. Is being dipped in a little bit of water enough to atone for the least of the sins I've ever committed in my life? Not a chance. Not a chance. Not a chance. Not a chance. Appeal for a good conscience before God. Right. Not removal of dirt from the flesh, but appeal to God for a good conscience. Exactly. I don't care how ornate that baptistry might be. You know, we could take that picture out of there and just have a blank wall back there. It wouldn't make any difference. You know, we can have some guy with his collar turned around backwards being the one that does the dipping. It doesn't make any difference. That can't possibly do the job. Let's move on. In 1 Peter chapter 1. I don't think we're going to get as far as I intended to here. But that's all right.
which is fine. That's, that's a good name for it. But they were chosen according to the foreknowledge. All right? Is that the same thing as predestination? When God knows something is going to happen, does that mean that he has predestined it to happen? Absolutely. Okay. I got to know from both sides. And that's correct. I may, for example, oh, I can think of any number of things. Uh, Leah had to learn the hard way what hot burn meant. Um, had a candle. And uh, I told Leah, Leah, you touch that candle, it's going to hurt. It's going to be hot burn. And uh, fortunately, she only dipped her finger in the wax. Well, it wasn't hot enough to actually cause damage, but it was hot enough to hurt. Well, I knew that was going to happen. I knew eventually Leah was going to get into a candle. I knew eventually Leah was going to get burned by something. I mean, that's just inevitable with children. It's happened to me. My parents couldn't keep me away from that. I had to learn what hot burn meant. Every child who's ever grown up has had to learn it the hard way. Because they don't understand hot burn. We may have foreknowledge that our child at some point is going to get burned to have to learn to stay away from hot things. Does that mean we predestined that to happen? No. no. When God said that Cyrus would be the one to allow the Jews to return to Jerusalem, did that mean he predestined Cyrus? To that end? No. no. He just knew of Cyrus's character and, and chose him to do it. Right. Now. It's like Jesus when he was praying in the garden. Not your will. Not my will, but your will. Because he didn't want to go to that cross, but he knew he needed to. Okay. When but Jesus he, foreknew that Judas would be the one to betray him, and Jesus told all of his apostles, but woe be to that one who betrays me. It would be better than a, that, I uh, forget the exact wording, but that an anchor was placed around his neck and be thrown into the sea. Does that mean that Judas was predestined? No. Just... Jesus warned him before he did it. Not to do it. But he knew he was going to do it anyway. He knew he wasn't going to be able to stop him. But he warned him. Gave him ample. Judas did it anyway. Of his own free will. Because all men are born as free moral agents. We say that, but what it means really is the exact opposite of this. God created us, remember, in our, in our initial lessons in his image, God is a free moral agent. He created us to be in his image as free moral agents. He placed man in the Garden of Eden. He gave him work to do, and he made the outcome sure, but God did not control man's actions in the Garden of Eden to force him to just walk in lockstep with what God wanted for him. That was a decision man made. And when Satan came along, and beguiled the woman. It says Eve was beguiled, but you know what? Adam wasn't beguiled. Adam knew what he was doing. And he did it anyway. Because he had the ability of choice in what he was doing. He wasn't fooled at all. He knew exactly what was going to happen. But you know, whatever reasons he had, his love for Eve or whatever, he went ahead and disobeyed God because he had that ability to choose that. And so do all of us. So we'll stop right there uh, in 1 Peter and we'll take up there then on Thursday night.